As we continue in the book of uh, Zechariah, uh, toward the end of the Old Testament, this post-exilic, post-exile prophet who uh, is receiving one vision after another from the Lord in the 6th century uh, B.C. here to guide his people, to convict his people, to bring hope to the people of God here in the midst of their rebuilding uh, efforts, rebuilding the life of worship, their call to rebuild uh, the temple, rebuild faith, the vision that comes in chapter 5 is one of, of two in chapter 5 that go really uh, hand in hand. They go together. We'll take them each in part. This is the sixth of eight visions. And in this vision, we have the picture of a house. It's not the central picture or central image, uh, but there is the picture of a house. Really, the houses of God's people, the house of your life, uh, the house of your faith. Think about the space that you uh, live in at home whether it's a house or a condo, apartment, depending on your upbringing, uh, your personality, your preferences, and those with whom you may live, the cleanliness, the tidiness of that space is somewhere on a spectrum, right? On the one end of that spectrum, uh, every countertop, every tabletop is clean and quite uh, bare, uh, to the point that for some of us, if you want toast, the toaster's not on the counter. The toaster's in a drawer. You take the toaster out, you plug it in, you make your toast, and you put it back. That's where it belongs, not on the counter. Every paper, magazine, object has a place, and by and large, it's not on the counter. To the other end of the spectrum, if there is a counter, if there's a tabletop, if there's space, you can't see it, right? Papers and books and cups, you name it, pretty much anything flat is covered. It's okay, we all know where we're at on that spectrum. Wherever you are, uh, one thing we all have in common, there's no space that cleans itself, right? And that's very true in the life of faith. For us as Christians, we don't merely clean ourselves up or make ourselves holy. And while the Lord calls his people to holiness and to purity, to clean hearts, uh, this is very much the work of the Lord. And that's very much what this vision is getting at in chapter 5 of Zechariah. So if we turn there, we'll read just four verses for this sixth of eight visions attention to God's word. Zechariah 5 verse 1. Again, I lifted my eyes and saw, and behold, a flying scroll. And he said to me, what do you see? I answered, I see a flying scroll. Its length is 20 cubits, its width 10 cubits. Then he said to me, this is the curse that goes out over the face of the whole land. For everyone who steals shall be cleaned out according to what is on one side, and everyone who swears falsely shall be cleaned out according to what is on the other side. I will send it out, declares the Lord of hosts, and it shall enter the house of the thief and the house of him who swears falsely by my name. And it shall remain in his house and consume it, both timber and stones." As we examine God's word together corporately or on your own as you open the scriptures, a good question always to ask is what would be missing if this passage were removed from the scriptures? God included it, so it has a purpose. Another way to ask that is what contribution does this passage make to the Christian faith? We might not think that the vision or, or image of a flying scroll uh, would contribute a whole lot, but we'll see indeed it does. The vision here speaks powerfully into the nature of our salvation and life with God, the kind of um, worship we are to have, the kind of God we worship, one that we'll see is covenantal, right? the relationship that we have with our Lord, the central place that the Word, the Scripture, is to have in our lives, how we are to see ourselves as saints who are cleansed and yet still sinners in need of washing. The vision, Zechariah sees, sinners on a scroll. In verse 1 and 2, he says, I looked and saw, behold, a flying scroll. Its length, 20 cubits, its width, 10 
cubits. A, a cubit is about 18 inches, about a foot and a half. So 20 cubits long, 10 cubits wide. 30 feet long, 15 feet wide. This is not a normal sized scroll. Like if we were using this on Sunday morning, I would need three or four of you to unroll this thing just to be able to read it. The point is, it's big. It's weighty. It's more like a billboard. It's confronting and uncompromising, powerful. It's the word of the Lord. It's his commands. It's his covenant stipulations. It's his precepts. Notice the other aspect, though, of this scroll. It's flying. It's a flying scroll, which speaks to its swiftness, like a bird of prey, flying and moving fast. It's covering much ground. It's imminent. Not only is it flying, but we're told in verse 3 and 4, it goes out over the face of the whole land. And it was sent out. It was sent out. So these are not words on a scroll or in a book up on a shelf collecting dust. This word has been sent out. It's making its way. It's on the move, and there's no area of life beyond its reach. No place to hide from it. It's pervasive in that way. Some commentators remark that this is the most chilling, terrifying warning passage in the Old Testament. Because either people are going to yield and submit to this word, or the word is going to consume that house, that life. It's going to be destroyed. Maybe not faith destroyed, but life in the here and now destroyed. Let's pause for a moment and ask the question, what kind of God reveals words that are terrifying? Is that a God I want to worship and to serve, to know? Well, if you're standing on train tracks and you do not realize it, nor do you see the thousands of tons of train cars in a distance billowing toward you, how loud and clear do you want someone to warn you? How welcoming would you be of terrifying words to guide you to safety? The word, the voice of God here is not everything he says. In Scripture, of course not. It doesn't reveal everything about our Lord, but it is his voice of caution and warning. That's what a good father does with his children. Hebrews 12 reminds us that it is for discipline you have to endure. God's treating you as sons. He relates and works with his people to discipline, to sanctify his swift and warning word here reveals something uh, about uh, himself, about this God. He is not indifferent to the world. He's not indifferent to us as his called people. The reality is the world, anyone outside of Christ, is standing on those tracks. It may not realize it, it may not care, but the word has gone out. In fact, the Bible tells us in Romans 1 that creation itself reveals, it's revelatory, it reveals the divine presence and power of God. Romans 1 tells us the wrath, the judgment of God is being revealed against ungodliness of men who suppress the truth. They, they push the truth down. They deny the truth, ignore the truth. But the train is coming. The word here, though, is directed more toward his own people, his covenant people, those with whom he has entered into relationship, those whom he has redeemed. This tells us not only is the Lord not indifferent toward what we think or believe or how we live, but as the Christian counselor Ed Welch once wrote, God's love better than unconditional. God's love better than unconditional. By that, Welch did not mean there aren't aspects of God's love that is unconditional. Right? His electing grace, his converting grace in the life of a sinner, is totally, purely his unmerited favor. It is his work. As one hears the good news of what Christ has done and the Holy Spirit applies that work, the Spirit breaks through into the life of that believer. 
That is based on no condition in man or woman. But after he converts and after he calls one to himself, the way he loves us and the way he relates to his people is anything but indifferent or nonchalant. That's what a good father does. A good father doesn't merely turn a blind eye or approve of whatever path, belief, or way the child goes. And so these words and vision need to be seen in the context of the kind of relationship God has initiated with us, which is a covenantal relationship. Which, among other things, means there are stipulations for flourishing. There's conditions to flourish in this relationship for any of us. Think of a wedding day. A man and woman, they make vows. They stand next to each other. They face each other and they make promises. I do promise and covenant, they say, to love, to care for, to serve one another. Our relationship with God is a covenantal one. And one of the places that we see very clearly this whole notion of the covenant relationship is in Leviticus 26. Remember, we might be thinking, yeah, but we're in the New Testament. That's right. It's the new covenant. It's covenantal. Our relationship with our Lord today is covenantal. In Leviticus chapter 26 is one of the few places where we see it laid out very clearly. Here's what the Lord says. To his people, in verse 3 and following, if you walk, there's the condition, if you walk in my statutes and observe my commandments and do them, then I will give you your rains in their season. I'll give you peace in the land. I'll turn to you and make you fruitful and multiply you. I'll walk among you and you will be, I will be your God, you shall be my people. There's a flourishing aspect to this. Verse 14, but... But if you will not listen to me and will not do all these commandments, but break my covenant, I'll visit you with panic. I'll set my face against you. Your strength shall be spent in vain. In the Christian faith, it is not works, it is not obedience that justifies us before the Lord. But it is obedience that evidences our justification. This is very complimentary if you've been attending adult Sunday school with Elder Warren's class. It's the fruit of faith that demonstrates God's grace, that that grace has taken hold of me. When you read in verse 3 there, the curse that goes out, we can think of Leviticus chapter 26. This is the stipulations of the relationship. Curse there means it's a verdict of disapproval. And condemnation. It's God's disapproving word if we're not seeking after him. And so if a person is very lax, very lax about the commandments of God, this vision here is a warning for for all of us. Notice the two sins or commands being broken that are revealed in the vision. Everyone who steals shall be cleaned out, and everyone who swears falsely shall be cleaned out. And it's suggested what we have here is a representation of the whole of God's command. We we can think of the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments are a summation, a summary of God's moral law. It has a horizontal aspect. The one who steals, that's doing uh, wrong toward our fellow man. The sort of horizontal aspect of God's commands. Swearing falsely. Perjury, uh, violating our promises and our commitments to the Lord. That's the vertical aspect. So as you think of those two commands, you can think of them as representative of the whole of God's law. Now, at this point, we might be thinking to ourselves, I get it, I need to be holy. I need to pursue a righteous life before the Lord. But you also might be thinking, didn't the Lord already address this in a previous vision? quite clearly, with Joshua, the high priest, in in chapter 3. You remember the picture there? Joshua, the high priest, called to intercede 
to mediate for God's people. But what's the problem? He's robed in filthy garments. And so the Lord says, remove his filthy garments and robe him in pure, holy vestments. A picture of God's grace reckoning his people as holy, robed in righteousness. Well, there's a wonderful relationship between these two visions, if you think about them in comparison. In the removal of filthy garments, being clothed in pure vestments, the Lord was dealing with man's need to be forgiven, to be justified, to have a new and right standing before God. But in the picture of the scroll, in the picture of the word, entering homes and hearts to clean them out, the Lord is dealing with man's need to be sanctified, to be renewed. And the people at this time need that commitment to be sure to rebuild the community of faith at this time of restoration. Really, it's man's need to repent. The word goes out. Think of Jesus' opening words as he began his ministry. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent, as we learned this morning in Sunday school, a change of mind. Fundamentally, first, a change in our thinking. Repent and believe in the gospel. Do we see how the Lord works in the life of his people? He doesn't convert people and then lead them to themselves. The word continues to come to us, to, to sanctify us. Really, at the heart of this is God's call upon us to bring the life and the practice of our faith in line with the profession of our faith. One of the sports that I enjoyed uh, playing growing up was tennis. It was the era of Andre Agassi. If uh, you're familiar with him, he was associated with commercials and sort of a theme, uh, quote, image is everything. And Agassi brought kind of a new flair to the game. He had the long hair, uh, headband, bright colored shorts and shirts. Um, Style and look uh, became all the more significant. Well, imagine you make your way to a tennis club and you see people playing on various courts and you see some people standing on the side and you see a young man and he's decked out with the best clothes. He's got a brand new bag, very expensive top of the line racket, best of gear. And you make your way over to him and you ask, uh, are you a member here? And he says, yeah, I I come here actually quite a bit. Well, do you want to rally? Do you want to hit some balls here? He says, I... Actually, I don't play tennis. In fact, I've never, I've never played. But you come here a lot. Yeah, but I don't, I don't really know how to hit the ball. I, I don't really understand the rules, to be honest with you. I just like to dress the part, and I like to watch. I'm not really a player. He looks the part, but he doesn't play the part. Uh, this happens to us as professing believers, or it can, Uh, Christian, but really in name only. The significance and the benefit of the scroll with writing, or God's commands on them, commands of uh, about theft, uh, offense toward man, uh, swearing falsely, offense toward God, the significance is this, it's easy and natural to fall into what I'm going to call generalizing obedience to the Lord. To think that Christianity is, in the final analysis, simply about a general kind of love. A general love toward God and a general love toward other people. Just in general. Well, the scripture calls us to love centrally, doesn't it? Those are the commands Jesus pointed out in Deuteronomy 6 and Leviticus 19. To love the Lord your God with all your heart. To love your neighbor as yourself. You might recall Paul's words in Galatians 5 as he's urging believers to serve and care for one another, he says this, the whole law, and that's what we're talking about, the commandments, the whole law is fulfilled in one word. And he draws from Leviticus, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But why isn't, why isn't it okay to have a Christianity that is simply about a generalized kind of love? Friends, it seems to me this is in part what has consumed and defined the liberal church today. This is in part what the social gospel is about. 
Words from Sinclair Ferguson in his excellent work on sanctification called Devoted to God Blueprints for Sanctification. Ferguson writes this. The question has been repeated frequently. If our salvation is by grace and our sanctification takes place through union with Christ and the power of the Spirit, what role, if any, is left for God's law? Does the gospel abolish it? A common enough answer today is that we now live in the power of the Spirit by love, which is the fulfillment of the law. After all, the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. Love is the fulfilling of the law, Romans 13. But then he goes on to say this. For one thing, the law is fulfilled by love. It is not replaced by love. This fulfillment means that law law is love-shaped and that love is law-shaped. In fact, love was always at the heart of God's law. It was given by love to be received in love and obeyed through love. The law is fulfilled by love. The law is to shape us into being a love-formed, love-shaped people. But I want to press this. The law, love does not replace the commandments. There are many commands. We think of the Ten Commandments. We think of Jesus' instruction to us and the Beatitudes and the Sermon on the Mount. We think of the exhortations and commands that we learn and seek to apply from the epistles in the New Testament. All of the scriptures. It's when we learn the commandments, it's when we sit before them, It's when we examine ourselves in light of them that we can then see our lives, see our sin, our need to repent. There's not much need to repent if I just have a generalized kind of love. Just kind of a general disposition out there. No, I need to know the commandments of God. If I'm going to have a heart after my Lord. That's what the Lord is after in part through Zechariah to the people. They need more than a renewed worship, more than a rebuilt temple. They need contrite, renewed hearts before the Lord. Think back to the last vision that we considered last week. The lampstand, the the promise and reminder of the presence of God with his people. Yes, the light will not go out, but the question that comes here in this vision is, How bright will the light be? The brightness of God's presence, the brightness of our faith, the brightness of our unity, the brightness of our effectiveness on Christ's mission depends in great part upon repentant, contrite hearts before the Lord. To draw near to Him. To have renewed hearts and desires after His word and His commands. Two words or statements from our confession in chapter 15 on repentance. It says this, Although repentance be not rested in as any satisfaction for sin or any cause of the pardon thereof. That is, the pardon or removal of our sin, forgiveness, our guilt within, is not because of our repentance. Rather, that is, it says, the act of God's free grace in Christ. But then it says, yet, it is of such necessity, this repentance, such necessity to all sinners that none may expect pardon without it. Forgiveness is by grace through faith in Christ, but repentance is a necessary means that God has prescribed to know His forgiveness, to know His continued sanctifying work. And here's the second line from the confession. Men ought not to content themselves with a general repentance. But it is every man's duty to endeavor to repent of his particular sins particularly. Again, this is very much what the Lord is bringing to Zechariah. This is for the good of God's people to see ourselves as we are. We think of Paul's words to Timothy. He names what he was and what he did formerly. Formerly, he says, I was a blasphemer. I was a persecutor, an insolent opponent, but I received mercy. He names his sins particularly. The scroll, the word of God, it is 
pervasive. There's no action, there's no thought that goes undetected. It reaches all places. Uh, the word is purposeful. Right? It is to bring our uh, life in line with our profession. But finally here, the word is piercing. It reaches the depths of our hearts to minister to us where we need to be ministered to. Sin can run very deep in our lives. Pain, and grief, brokenness, sin it can run very deep. Sometimes so deep we feel what the psalmist felt as we read earlier from uh, Psalm 69. Save me, O God, the waters have come up to my neck. I sink in deep mire. O God, you know my folly. You know the wrongs I have done. They're not hidden from you. But as for me, my prayer is to you, O Lord, at an acceptable time, O God, in the abundance of your steadfast love. Answer me in your saving faithfulness. Sin and brokenness can run so deep we cannot remedy it alone. We need someone else. We need the great physician. A couple of weeks ago, I began having a pain around one of my uh, teeth. Not a new issue for me. Uh, but I couldn't figure out what was causing this, this pain. It wasn't in the tooth. It was below the tooth, and it was feeling it in the gums, and it was beginning to spread. I already had a dental appointment lined up for something else, for filling, so I just waited. And I showed up, and I told him and explained to him the situation. He began to probe. He's looking around with his dental tools, more searching, more digging. Finally, with his small tweezer-like tool, he pulled out a very small seed-like object. And I looked up and I could see him. He's got it in his hands and he said, it looks like a tiny part of, of a popcorn seed. Now, if you know me, I like popcorn. I'm not going to stop eating popcorn. But that was the cause. Just that little piece of seed. Day after day, this pain was just spreading and spreading. Though small, though sometimes deep down in the crevices of our hearts, the Lord Jesus desires to bring all of our life, our thoughts, our desires, our works, our relationships. He desires to bring all things in our life under his lordship. That's his grace. That's, that's his sanctifying work and grace in our lives. Might we yield to him more and more of who we are, that he would have his way with us. May we know that he is a gracious Lord as he works in us and upon us by his word and by his spirit and, and in the life of the church. Let's pray together. Gracious Heavenly Father, we pray to you knowing that we are sinners saved by your favor, by your grace and your mercy and your wonderful love. We thank you, Lord, for the promises in your word that nothing can separate us from the love of Jesus Christ. And yet we thank you, Lord, that you are a God who probes, who seeks to enter the deepest parts, some of the darkest parts of our life and our hearts and our minds, that you would sanctify us. Lord, we thank you that you are a God who, as he does that work, um, he does so as one who has already made us justified in your sight that you hold us by your secure hands. And yet, Lord, do sanctify us, do grow us, that we can know new seasons of life and flourishing with you and with one another. And so we, we yield to you, our Savior and our Master and our Lord. We pray that you continue to feed us this morning, Lord, not only from your word, but from the table. Um, that We would know more of that wonderful union and communion with you. For this we pray with thanks in Jesus' name. Amen.